the topic of my talk will be plant de novo genome sequencing and assembly using the Oxford Nanopore technology. So I always tend to divide a de novo genome project in three parts, where the first is DNA extraction, the second part is then sequencing, which is kind of involving everything from library prep, running the sequencer, base crawling, and then uh, the third part is bioinformatics. And surprisingly for everyone not working with plants, I would say there are kind of a similar amount of work and time requirement because especially this part is critical because if you don't get good DNA out of the species you're working with, then you can't fix this problem in the later steps. So as already mentioned, um, how we started was the Solanum penelii genome, um, which was the first GIGA-based uh, genome uh, done with the nanopore technology. We had there the very great advantage that we already had a working DNA extraction protocol which was established because our group had been sequencing another ecotype of this four years uh, before that with um, uh, Illumina technology. So this uh, protocol involved uh, destarching the plants two days in the dark to re reduce the amount of um, starch as much as you can because carbohydrates are actually an issue in plant DNA extraction and starch is the one you can get easily away. Pectin, you on the other hand can't, but at least you get rid of as much as you can. So, and then it also involves stabilization of nuclei with hexylin glycol. Um, this helps to keep your nuclei intact while you lyse the cell wall around it and remove all the contaminations that are there before those like polyphenols can get in contact with your DNA and um, then uh, oxidize it. So what we did then was we used back then the uh, available LSK108 uh, library protocol, prep protocol and did size selection for 12 and 15 KB high pass on a Pippin automated size selection. And um, yeah, and now by today's standards, this is not an impressive amount of data. Today, this would probably be 10 minion runs or less. But in 31 minion runs, we generated about 115 gigabases of data and got the genome to a quite decent N50 of 2.52 megabases. And the genome size is quite similar to what we had seen with the Illumina assembly already. So after this had worked very nicely, we thought we move on to something, um, well, a bit more challenging as it turned out. We were interested in Vinca minor, which is kind of a perennial species, but it contains some interesting secondary metabolites that are pharmaceutically interesting. Um, but the problem is, as I mentioned, those can bind and um, oxidize your DNA. So often we had very low yield or a just a small brown pellet in the end. So we tried very different approaches with uh, ampure beads or similar beads and silica columns and that all really didn't work well. Um, what in the end worked best was a nuclear extraction, uh, uh, nuclear based extraction, but not with hexylin glycol, that didn't work well but with sucrose, spermidine, and spermine because this somehow kept the vinca uh, nuclei better intact than the other ones. Um, we also tried different library approaches there, the famous uh, rapid ultra-long uh, sequencing protocol, which didn't work in our hands for this because unlike human DNA, plant DNA is because of the mechanical force of uh, the DNA extraction to get rid of the plant cell wall already a bit more damaged than human DNA. So we got not many reads about 20K with that. What worked best is a similar approach as for Penelii. And in the end, we did some uh, one pot preparations where you combine the FFPE repair, a tailing and ligation in one step. Um, and then uh, after a 20 kV size selection, or you do the size selection before and then this one pot prep, it worked, but it gave lower total yield because you can't get rid of all the enzymes then in just one cleanup. So the assembly strategy was actually similar to uh, what we had done on um, Penelii already. We did a canoe error correction. We did a smart de novo assembly, polished it with Illumina data. And for the first time here, we used um, high C scaffolding with the phase genomics uh, library preparation protocol. And with just one next tech run, we could massively improve our genome quality. So before we were getting an N50 of about 600 KB, which is not terrible, but also not great. But after we uh, did the high C library preparation, we got it pretty much to a chromosome scale. 
um, when you look at it's 23 chromosomes in total and we got about 50% of all the genomes uh, in just seven scaffolds, um, we can assume that we got most of the chromosomes together there. So, but here we kind of realized we need to get better on how we do our libraries. So 15 to 20 KB size selections worked well for Penelii. However, they don't work for all species because depending on the species, the amount of repeats and the size of those repeats differs. There are actually some that are larger than 20 and I think even 30 KB. And to um, anchor or span a repeat, you need at least five reads or so that are longer than that to kind of get a continuous assembly. So for that, we kind of needed to develop a better um, library preparation. And especially for genomes larger than two gigabase pairs, we couldn't get along with just like one gigabase uh, per flow cell. So we had to improve on DNA extraction and library prep protocol. Um, so what we did is um, we first switched from G-tube shearing to needle shearing, then loaded both on a normal GL and saw no difference because you basically just see a single band on a uh, normal GL. So we kind of started establishing pulse field electrophoresis in our lab. And that's what we do nowadays. This is the series from zero to 30 shears. So zero, one, five, 10, 15, up till 30. And then uh, we kind of see that we get most of our DNA. So this strong band is 48 and this is 97 uh, kilo bases that we get most of our DNA in between that range. Because and then when we select with a pippin afterwards for like 30, 40 kb high pass selections, you get your peak somewhere here. Um, and with this, we could massively improve. This was kind of a Penelii type prep where we got an N50 for the read length of 19 kb. Uh, this got up to uh, 35 kb when we did the 30 kb plus selection with the existing pippin protocols. But really the improvement came in when uh, uh, Blue Pippin uh, released their new high pass uh, plus cartridges end of last year. And then we can get 44, 45, I think the best we got was 46 uh, KB and 50 read length. I have to admit this is a bit unfair comparison because this is a Promethean run and those two are Minine runs, so don't worry about the size. But also on the Minine uh, cells, we could increase the yields to about eight, uh, nine uh, gigabases per cell these days. Um, so with that having established or in the middle of establishing, we went on to a bit bigger genome uh, project, which is Chrysalis exocarpa. It's a vegetable used as a basis for chilies in um, middle America. It's evolutionarily interesting because Chrysalis is one of the few genera that we see in Asia and Europe as well as in the New World, so America. Um, but there are still one genus, not the just one family. So um, we could actually reuse, because it, those all are nightshades, reuse the DNA extraction protocol from Solanum penelii with a few minor um, adaptions. Mostly, you can't destarch this plant for three days because it would die, <laughs> we figured out. But um, yeah, with some minor details, we could uh, just get the same things working for uh, Penelii. And then um, we are we're also benefiting from progress in the nanopore technology. So we started with 940 pores. It got better with 941 and made another improvement when we got the uh, revision B uh, flow cells. And also this was the first project where we could use our Promethean uh, for, which kind of uh, reduces the amount of library preps by far because you just need one Promethean run where you needed six, seven, eight uh, Minine runs before. Um, we tried different uh, approaches for assembly here because newer tools got available. So we tried the read error correction again with Canoe Correct. We also tried Lordec, however, it didn't work that well on genomes that large. It worked for smaller genomes up to one, 1 1.2 gigabases, but didn't work for us. So we stick there with Canoe. Uh, and then we tried Smart Novo's kind of uh, newer version, which is WTDBG2, um, and it got better results. We also tried other assemblers like Miniasm, Fly, and Ra, but at some point they always kind of have a core dump because they need more RAM for assembling this amount of data. 
which isn't available on our uh, cluster system and then the process just dies after a week or so. Um, so we kind of had to resort to WTDBG uh, because this is the only one who can cope with that amount of data we give it. So, and then we also try different polishing uh, approaches. So this here first is the unpolished um, uh, assembly and you see here the, the BUSCO results. BUSCO is uh, kind of assessing if all the genes that you would expect in a plant are there. So you want as much complete as you can and as few fragmented or missing as you can. So we first tried VWTDBG's own polishing with nanopores. It actually, to our surprise, got slightly worse, but therefore we think it got structurally better. So it kind of fixes the bigger scope better than the single base level. This is because, well, nanopore has still a higher error rate, so it didn't make this on a base-to-base -base level better. Um, but then when we started using pylon with Illumina data, it got massively better already after the first cycle. And when we did three more, we kind of um, yeah, headed to a pretty much reference genome quality. Uh, we then tried if the assembler, uh, if the liner actually had an influence by trying BWA instead of Bowtie for the fourth round. But as you see here, this almost had n made no difference. So, and um, with this being done, we also, of course, wanted to sequence a relative from the old world. So we went for Physalis alkakengi, which is the ornamental uh, Physalis some of you might know. It has a similar genome size. We used the same DNA extraction again. Um, since the LSK109 was available then and we had the high pass plus cartridges, it got um, easier because we didn't have to come up with new ideas how to do it. But what then uh, changed it massively was that flip-flop based calling became available very recently. And uh, so we c um, kind of combined this as Kanu error correction and WTDBG assembly and polishing. And um, what we realized is flip-flop significantly, significantly increases the assembly quality. So um, this is uh, no flip-flop and straight to WTDBG. Um, and when you compare this to flip-flop with Kanu correction and WTDBG, the N50 is already um, massively better. Um, but even if you leave um, Kanu then out and use um, flip-flop instead of no flip-flop, you get a way better N50 just because it can somehow, we guess, we haven't checked actually, uh, assemble this GC which repeats way better, which you can also see on when you don't use flip-flop, the GC content differs. But all this is massively better than what we had previously for Ixocarpa as a comparison here on the side. So basically we are here without high C where we got for Ixocarpa with high C. So we got it to 4.0 with high C. So this is impressive somehow that we could get the effort down from about a year for Ixocarpa to just one month for uh, Elke Kengi. Um, but yeah, the technology has helped us a lot. But finally, uh, no genome is complete without genomes. So to define genes, you always need um, transcriptome data. So we tried kits for getting the RNA, but they give a very low yield. They do give an okay quality on RNA, but you ain't gonna get far when you just get four microgram of total RNA from RON extraction. So we used actually a protocol from the 90s originally developed for uh, pine needle RNA extraction which is a CTAP extraction uh, followed by several phenylchloroform or chlorofilm precipita uh, cleanups and lithium uh, precipitations and ethanol washes. And this gives the highest amount of uh, good RNA. And then we did an oligo DT uh, coupled uh, um, cellulose beads for cleanup and used the then only available version one of the direct RNA sec library preparation and while this is pretty complicated, the bioinformatics part actually is pretty easy compared to the um, RNA-seq thing, uh, to the um, Illumina RNA-seq. So it's just mapping with minimap and structural annotations with string pi, and we could get about two thirds of all the genes that should be there already just in one run. Um, and we actually tried functional annotation already with our Mercator pipeline, 
and you can see that basically all genes that should be there are there. Um, so to, to conclude, um, on the first part, um, optimization for each uh, species is necessary. Um, protocols can be transferred with on f within one family, but often enough need some optimizations and DNA qu uh, quality massively influences your later yield. We could optimize the shearing and uh, increase the yield twofold and massively increase the N50 from 20 to 44, also with the help of newer technologies. And newer assemblers make a massive difference. Uh, they massively speed up the analysis and also improve the results. And RNA-seq is really the way to go for annotating genes in uh, plant species these days. Um, it's, yeah, no chance to get the same with Illumina. So with this, I'm kind of done and would to uh, mention my collaborators in our lab as well as uh, our collaborators um, from uh, Hebrew University Max Planck Institute or Genoscope who collaborated with us on the Penelli I project and Zachary Lipman from Cold Spring Harbor who's currently collaborating with us on the Chrysalis project as well as our funding agencies, Oxford Nanopore for inviting me here and you for your attention, thank you. So yes, thank you very much, Max, for a great talk and some fantastic work. So we have time for like one quick question and then we have to move on. And so keep your question, write them down so we keep them for the panel discussion. Very nice uh, presentation, thank you very much. The blue pippin step uh, you showed is also very nice, but did you also look at the larger, uh, the right side of the spectrum? Because we find that doing blue pippin, you also lose large fragments. Yes, but our experience kind of was, um, that's also why we do the shearing. If you don't do the shearing, your yield goes massively down because somehow the large reeds tend to clog your pores a bit faster than the smaller ones. So we kind of are balancing here between um, yield and long reads. I mean, you can get longer when you leave the shearing away and also use other methods for uh, not using the pippin. You're right, it cuts off somewhere above 100 kb. We see very few reads that are longer than that, but it helps on the yield side if you narrow it down a bit. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Nice uh, results, uh, thank you.